He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to bring captivity free, to announce the year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication. Comfort all who mourn. Spirit of God is upon me. Spirit of God has anointed me. Spirit of God has sent me to the poor to heal the brokenhearted. Spirit of God is upon us. The Spirit of God is within us. The Spirit of God has anointed us. He is here. He'll heal the brokenhearted. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, give us your Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. I roll this work on you, Jesus, and I commit this message to you. Cause my thoughts to be agreeable to your will. Let it be exactly the word that every hungry heart here needs to hear so that you will be glorified. I want everyone to say this. I cover myself, my mind, my heart in the blood of Jesus. I will not be distracted from God's holy word. Today, the Lord will answer the cry of my heart and I will receive the revelation that I've been praying for. I sprinkle us with the blood of Jesus because Jesus, you are alive in us. Say it. Jesus, you are alive in us. There's an ancient story out of the Middle East which tells of three merchants. They were crossing the desert at night because they were trying to avoid the heat of the day and they were passing over a dry creek bed and then a loud, attention-demanding voice out of the darkness commanded them to get down off their camels, stoop down, and pick up pebbles from that dry creek bed. Put them in their pockets. So after they had done what they were ordered to do, the voice also told them to continue until dawn and set up camp. This mysterious voice said, in the morning, you will be both happy and sad. Understandably shaken, they obeyed and they traveled all through the night. All through the rest of the night, they kept there until morning dawned. Anxiously, they looked in their pockets and instead of pebbles, there were precious jewels. And they both were happy and sad. Happy that they had picked up some of the pebbles. Sad because they hadn't gathered more of them when they had the opportunity to. This fable expresses how many of us feel about the treasure of God's word. There's coming a day when we will be thrilled that we have absorbed as much as we have, but said that we had not gleaned even more of the word of God. Jewels are best shown off, held up to a bright light, and slowly turned so that each polished facet could reflect and catch the light. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus, the priceless jewel above every jewel, as seen in the light of God's word, so that the Holy Spirit will develop in us his character, and so that we will be strengthened in our faith. Unlocked in this portrait of him is the riches of Christ, the riches of Jesus, and this thrill of this search is now just ahead of us. So let's get down off our camels, pick up a few jewels. I entitled this message, Jesus is Alive in Us. Say it, Jesus is Alive in Us. Galatians 3.13, do I have that? Thank you. Christ has redeemed from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, and that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. 
And if ye be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. When we put our faith in Jesus, we become his spiritual seed. And through Jesus Christ, the covenant, the blessings, the promises, all the provision comes to us. Every, everything that is promised in the covenant, especially the promise of the Holy Spirit to come and live in us if we believe in Jesus. 1 John 3, 9. Got that over there? 1 John 3, 9. Yes? Yes. Everyone who truly is God's child refuses to keep sinning because God's seed remains within him. God's seed, it's a Greek word for sperma. It means male seed. God's sperma remain, remains within him. He's unable to continue sinning because he's born of God. He's fathered by God himself. Every one of us who is born again, we have been fathered by God himself. And we carry his DNA. And we carry his genes. Hmm, that's the seed. Supernatural seed. 1 Peter 1.23. Let's look at that. For through the eternal living word of God, you have been born again, and the seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed, but will live and grow inside you forever. An amplified translation of 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been regenerated. Got that there? Amplified. <laughs> You have been regenerated, born again, not from mortal origin, seed or sperm, but from one that is immortal by the ever-living, everlasting word of God. It's a new birth. It's a change. It's the revelation of your soul. You, you renovated Christ in you, the hope of glory. We become a new creation, and we are covenanted with almighty God himself. Think about it. We have a covenant with God Almighty. Now, so I wanted you to see this thing about the seed because I want to share with you a secret, a secret that has been revealed to me. And I want you to read the scripture right here. It'd be Psalm 25, 14. We have that, 25, 14? Psalm 25, 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant, the secret, the secret. A secret has to be unveiled, it has to be discovered, it has to be studied out, a secret, a secret, searched out, and show them the covenant. What covenant? A secret covenant, one that has to be searched out, unveiled, looked at. What about a covenant made before the foundation of the world. What about that covenant? And I'm going to speak to you about a covenant which was made before the foundation of the world. In Revelation 13, it says, Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain in sacrifice before the foundation of the world. So let's imagine together. When mankind was just a thought in the heart of God, long before creation of the world, the covenant God of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, made a covenant with each other. It was regarding the salvation of us, all mankind. And Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, he would be the center of that plan. I imagine that God the Father would say to Jesus, the only merit a man can bring to my throne will be your merit, my son. And let's discuss when they... When they stray, what's going to happen when they stray? And I imagine that Jesus would offer these promises to the heavenly council. I will go and I will find them. I will find the lamb who has strayed. And I will not rebuke him. I will not chastise him. I will not beat him. Tenderly, I will restore him to the fold. I imagine the father would say to the son, and what about when they fall into sin? And what about when they're in despair? And what about when they're bound by habits and, 
and chains. And I believe that Jesus would have said, I'll go. I will release them from their prison. I will break those chains. And Jesus alluded to this in Luke 4.18 when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set the prisoners free and heal the brokenhearted. I believe that these were the kind of conversations that were held between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the beginning of time. This covenant was planned in the heavenly council eons before God ever spoke creation into being. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing in your life that the Blessed Trinity did not take into consideration, not one thing. And what about the Holy Spirit's role in this covenant? I believe that he agreed to be poured out as power. I imagine that the Holy Spirit would say, I will come and I will set up my power in my temple, the body of believers. Jesus, you will have the fullness, my fullness, without measure. And I will raise you up from the dead, Jesus. And then when you're seated at the right hand of the Father, I'll be poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost. And I'll make believers a new creation. And I will come into their bodies. And every believer will be my dwelling place. And there I will dwell until their hearts sing, Abba Father, Daddy God. Abba Father, Daddy God. Abba Father, gentle Lord. Abba Father, Daddy God. Abba Father, I receive your love. You have not received a spirit that makes you afraid of fear. You have now received his spirit. By him you cry, Father dear. Abba Father, Daddy God. Abba Father, Gentle Lord, Abba Father, Daddy God, Abba Father, we receive your love. Now listen, the Holy Spirit cannot do his work to strengthen you unless you surrender completely. And you have to surrender all your efforts to strengthen yourself. Some don't walk in the power of God because they're trying to do the work that the Holy Spirit is meant to do. If that's you, let's pray together right now. Holy Spirit, I believe you dwell in me and you can become the strength to overcome the sin's grip. The sin's grip, the grip, the grip, the grip, the creep, the creepy sin. <laughs> You can become the strength that I need to overcome the grip of sin, drugs, anxiety, fear, any brokenness. Think of the brokenness that you have in your own life right now. I have yet to experience the fullness of your power in me, but you have made a covenant and it includes me, and you'll not break it, and I will hold to that promise. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. If you sincerely prayed that prayer, the Holy Spirit's going to incline you to obedience. He's going to prompt you. He's going to remind you. He's going to strengthen you, and he will strengthen you and invite you to surrender to God's love. Whatever grips you, whatever beats you up, Whatever it is, whatever it is, Jesus says, I am coming after you, and I will not let you go. Throughout the scriptures, we see reference to this heavenly covenant. In Psalm 89, 34, God declares, my covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. A covenant is an agreement. It's a pledge. It's a contract. It's a promise between two or more parties. A covenant contains terms and duties that you have to perform, that they have to perform, obligations and privileges that have to be performed by those who are in the covenant. Okay, in the marriage covenant, we vow that we will stay together until death do us part. And that's what we do. We vow that. That's an agreement. 
In the Old Testament, God makes one covenant after the other with us. Jesus said at the Last Supper, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The the disciples knew that they were making a covenant. They knew. They knew that it was a covenant. It was the strongest, most sacred covenant known to the heart of man. And we make that covenant when we become born again. We are in covenant with Almighty God. This secret heavenly covenant was not made totally in secret. (laughs) The scripture openly records the terms of the covenant so that we could see it. In Psalm 89.9, have that up there? Okay. We find an example. This is a conversation between the father and the son with the father saying, this is a mysterious word I'm about to give you. Because of their, their sin, mankind will become overwhelmed and helpless to find their way back to me. So I'm appointing you as my holy one to help them. And I'm sending you to them as one mightier than them to bring them back to my favor. Now let's look at Hebrews 10, verses 5 and 6. Got that over there? Hebrews 10? Yep. Hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have no delight. Then I said, Behold, here I am, coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book. And in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated, sanctified, through the offering made once and for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Let's look at Matthew 13, 35. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Jesus uttered things that were kept secret from the foundations of the world. Even when Jesus said his final prayer and he was talking to his father, it was about this covenant. He's saying, Father, I want those to, that you've given me to be with me where I am, see my glory, the glory that you've given me before the creation of the world. One translation that I found of John 17, 24, it actually says, Father, I know that just as you will bring me to glory, you will bring my seed to glory too. Wow. Trust in Jesus. Depend on him. He made an everlasting covenant with the Father and the Holy Spirit to ensure us that if we put our trust in him, we'll see the glory no matter what. Settle it in your mind. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens in your heart. When you reach out to the Lord in repentance, he will not turn away from you. Don't go another moment condemning yourself. Not another moment. No Christian should ever remain in broken fellowship with Jesus any longer than it takes to say, forgive me. That quick. Now, these are the ending days, and Satan wants to pour out his wrath on us because he knows that his time is short. But we meet We need to be more than conquerors. We need to know the tactics of Satan, the schemes of Satan. Okay, so one tactic that the enemy uses is to convince you that you've sinned too often. He wants to convince you're unclean, you're unholy. You're a disgrace to the gospel, and I'll cast you out. He thinks that it it will work on us. He says these things to us. Next time you are struggling with a besetting sin, and you have Satan's accusatory voice speaking to you, say this. Let's practice it. I am in blood covenant with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus signed it in his blood. He promised to keep me in all temptation. 
He holds my hand no matter what. He will never remove his love. And I will be in glory with Jesus because I have his royal seed remaining in me. Jesus is alive in us. In the first letter of Peter, we read that we've been born again from an immortal seed, an ever-living, everlasting word of God. Peter knows all about that immortal seed. He experienced the power of that seed firsthand. Faithful Holy Spirit, I ask you to enable me to bring this fresh revelation of Jesus, how marvelous, how wonderful, how magnificent he is, so that our faith will really be strengthened. Let's look at Jesus and his actions, his love actions. Let's see Jesus, how he handles certain situations, gracious, kind, loving, merciful, totally unique in the way he deals with his people, so sensitive to their feelings. Let's read John 21, 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise, he showed himself. I want you to stop there. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. It says, after these things. What things? What things? Remember, Jesus warned Peter and all the disciples, that they were going to be tested and sifted as weak. Look at Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith not fail. And when you recover, strengthen your brethren. But Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will have three times denied that you even know me. All the Lord's disciples would be sifted, but we're privileged to get a glimpse of Peter's sifting only. We all have our siftings. We will have, we have, and it's going to be till we see Jesus. Remember, Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. So Peter made death the measure of his love for Jesus. But Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will deny me. Peter had been making very extreme, bold statements about his love for Jesus. But the sad picture of Peter's failure is recorded in John 18, verse 17. John 18, verse 17. The servant girl that kept the door said to Peter, aren't you one of this man's disciples? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and the guards had made a fire of coals. I want you to look at that. They had made a fire of coals. For it was cold, and they were standing warning themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And they said to him, you are also one of his disciples, aren't you? But Peter denied it and said, I am not. Then a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off said, did I not see you in the garden with him? And again, Peter denied it. And immediately a rooster crowed. If you go over to Luke 22, verse 61, you'll see this scripture. And the Lord turned, and he looked at Peter. Mm -hmm. And Peter recalled the Lord's words, how he had told him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. The cock crowed, and just as Peter had denied the Lord for the third time. But right here, we get a glimpse of how faithful, how loving, how merciful, how forgiving our Savior Jesus really is. Jesus takes notice of what we do, what we say, more than we think that he does. 
Peter had disowned Jesus. But Jesus did not disown Peter. Amen. Jesus could have justly forsaken him, left him, never looked at him again. He could have denied him before the Father in heaven. But he would not do it. Isn't Jesus so beautiful? Amen. He's so forgiving. What I want to point out here is Jesus does not deal with us as our sins deserve. And Jesus does not deal with us as we deal with him. Even in the face of betrayal, Jesus remains loyal, faithful, forgiving. That's our Jesus, the one we love, the one we adore. Jesus looked at Peter, a look that no one but Peter would understand the meaning of that. This look had a great deal of meaning in it. I believe that Jesus, who is love himself, looked at Peter with love, with tenderness. I can almost hear what Jesus is saying with his eyes. Peter, you've fallen in weakness. If I don't rescue you, you'll be lost. Jesus locked gazes with Peter, and grace went into Peter's heart because love never fails. Supernatural power, seed power, changed Peter's heart. It brought him back into his right mind. Just one look from Jesus melted Peter's heart. The flame in Peter's heart had nearly put out. It was nearly gone, but Jesus lit it up again. Peter saw a fiery love burning in the eyes of Jesus. I believe the fiery flame in Jesus leaped out and went into Peter's heart and ignited the flame again. Revelation 1.14 says about Jesus, his eyes are a flame of fire. Those flaming eyes sparked the fire. It sparked the fire in Peter's heart again. You know, Jesus had looked at the chief priests, but it didn't make any impression on them. It made no impression on them at all. Not like it did on Peter. Do you know why? I think you do know. Peter had the divine seed remaining in him. He had something to work on. The seed, the word of God was in him. One look at Jesus, one look from Jesus, and flaming grace flies out into Peter's heart. Brothers and sisters, we have that flame. We have that seed. We have that seed in us that can be word a supernatural seed of Jesus. Jesus is alive in us. Just one look from Jesus and we recover. Yes, we will recover. The eyes of Jesus look right through us. They look right through Peter. They look right through you and me. Hmm, eyes penetrating. Hmm, searching, quieting, assuring understanding eyes of Jesus. You know what I mean, I'm sure. For haven't we all had Jesus look at us? Scripture says, not a creature exists concealed from the sight of the Lord, but we are all open and naked to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Years ago, I was having trouble, big trouble. I was having trouble with my eyes, and I was having a terrible time fighting the devil over my eyesight. Until Jesus gave me this Peter scripture here. It is written, instead of Simon, Simon, listen, it was Dolores, Dolores, listen. Satan has obtained permission to come and sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Dolores, that your faith will not fail and that you will stay faithful. And after you have recovered, strengthen the faith of the brethren. I had a flaming sword, and I said, listen up, devil. Jesus, the great high priest, ever lives to make intercession. And he's praying so my faith cannot fail. And then I said, oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, it says when I recover. So I'm recovering no matter what. That's what God's word says. And I will strengthen the brethren when I recover. When I read the Passion Translation, it actually said, after you have recovered, make it your life mis mission to strengthen the faith of the brethren. So that flaming, that flaming sword, that it is written, 
brought deliverance. It brought deliverance to Peter. I never forget it. Peter never forgot it. He wept bitterly when he denied Jesus. But he never denied him again. Ancient writings tell us as long as Peter lived, he shed tears every time he heard the cock crow, every time he remembered his denial. But then he remembered the great mercy of the master and that he received mercy. Jesus, tell, Jesus held on to Peter. He loved Peter. He helped Peter. He prayed him through. And Jesus prays us through. Even if you have nobody praying for you, the great intercessor, Jesus prays for you. And never will one of his prayers fail. He says he prays for us. He promised to pray for us. He did. And he prayed Peter through, and he prays us through. Jesus is alive in us. Whew, before we go, let's take a look at the fishing trip. I like that fishing trip on the Sea of Tiberias where Jesus showed himself to the disciples. He said, after these things. Remember? Now we found out what things. The denial. All the problems. Jesus looking at him. We know what things. So Peter had said, as for me, I'm going fishing. He wanted to get away from everything. He wanted to get away from everything. So he said, I'm going fishing. And the disciples said, we're going with you too. And so they're fishing, fishing, fishing. All night long they fish, but they catch no fish. They try every old fishing hole that they ever knew. Port Jeff Harbor, <laughs> Riverhead Bank, Old Glen Cove, the Ron Concoma Fishing Hole of Gallery. It's cold. Nets are heavy. The emptiness of it all. They felt empty. They felt empty. Fished all night caught nothing. Jesus had called them away from fishing. They had no business being out there fishing. But come morning, Jesus is there on the shore. He says, children, have you caught anything? Why ask questions? Why not rebuke them? Why not scold them? Give them ping a pong -a. Make them get in line. Don't they know? Don't they need it? Uh, but see how Jesus does it. He tells them, put the nets on the other side. Same boat, same water, same nets. <laughs> what a change. So many fish now, they can't even haul them in. Now, Jesus loves Peter dearly, and he's going to deal with Peter in a very clever, remarkable way, very gently, very gently, without causing him embarrassment before the other apostles. So the Lord has some coals of fire on the shore. I want you to notice that. Coals of fire and bread and fish. And I imagine Jesus telling Peter, come, come, Peter, warm yourself here by the coals of fire. Peter remembers the last time he warmed himself by the coal of fire. Wasn't it in the presence of the Lord's enemies? Wasn't he standing with them? Weren't Jesus and Peter thinking of that same fire. Jesus hands Peter a piece of bread, and he eats with him. But the fire of Peter's conscience was hotter than any fire there. I'm sure that the devil did a tap dance on Peter's head. I know he, the devil was having a heyday. <laughs> I can almost hear the thoughts in Peter's mind. I can hear them. Lord, I am such a failure. I've grieved your heart, I've disappointed you. I am so miserable. Jesus, I'm ashamed. My heart is broken. I still need you, Lord. How can you be kind to me? How can you make me breakfast? Blame me. Scold me. I deserve it. Jesus, will you ever let me be close to you again? Will you ever let me? Can I ever, can you ever trust me? Can you ever trust me with your love and fellowship again? That's what I think he was thinking. Can you identify with Peter? Yeah. Haven't we all failed Jesus in many different ways? Don't we botch things up? Don't we live to regret our words, our actions? Don't we regret the failures and how many different ways we failed Jesus? We're guilty as charged. Jesus has no rebuke for Peter. He eats and speaks with him. 
just like always. But after breakfast, Jesus said, Simon Peter, Peter, do you love me? Actually, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? In the original, there are two words used for love there, agape and phileo, phileo. The word for the Lord that the Lord used there was agape. Jesus said, Peter, do you agape me? That means, do you deeply love me with a sacrificial love? Agape is the strongest word in the Greek language. The word is used to show God's love for the world. And Jesus is using the strong word. But hadn't Peter declared that his love was as strong as death? But we see here that Peter's failure taught him a lesson. He found out he did not love Jesus enough to die for him. Peter knows what the Lord is getting at. So he answers, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Phileo means I'm fond of you. It's used to show affection, brotherly love. Phileo is the weaker word for love. So Peter's saying, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. He doesn't dare use the strong word. So the Lord takes this confession for what it's worth, and he says, feed my lambs. Second time, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you agape me? And Jesus uses the strong word. Peter says, Lord, you know, I'm fond of you. Hmm. Peter uses the weak word. And so Jesus says, feed my sheep. The third time Jesus speaks to Peter, we get a beautiful lesson from beautiful Jesus when we cannot measure up to the strong place that Jesus would have us reach, he comes down to us in the measure of love that we're capable of. And so this time Jesus says, Peter, are you fond of me? And this just about breaks Peter's heart. Yes, Lord, you do everything. You know that I'm fond of you. Feed my sheep. Three times Peter failed and denied Jesus. Three times Peter confesses his love for Jesus. It was all that Jesus wanted. He gained the victory, yet he never rebuked Peter before the others. He never made Peter feel ashamed in front of them. He made sure that the other disciples heard him reinstate Peter. Isn't Jesus beautiful? What about the other disciples? Don't you think that they had discussed Peter's failure among themselves? Oh, poor Peter. Wasn't that terrible? He failed. Oh, boy, did he fail miserable. Mm-hmm, what an awful thing happened. We really must pray for Peter. He needs prayer. But it was not their prayers that won the victory. Jesus prayed for Peter. He prayed him through. And Jesus prays us through. Brothers and sisters, have you ever been criticized, misjudged, lied about, hurt by those close to you, betrayed by those who should have defended you. It's so wonderful just to stand there and see the salvation of the Lord, to see vindication, to see deliverance, to see how Jesus will exonerate you. Yes, Jesus can and does in wonderful ways close the mouth of those who do not understand and bless you in their presence and honor you in front of those who dishonor you. Isn't Jesus wonderful? loving, kind, how safe he is in dealing with our hearts. Let's love him more and more. Let's trust him more and more. Let's commit our hearts to his tender, wise dealings, the amazing love and care that he has for us. In Ephesians, it says, we are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, members of his own body for Christ nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes his body, the church. Jesus is alive in us. Gabby, would you get ready that DVD that we're going to show? Okay. In these last few minutes, I'm going to show you something that will really touch your heart. It's short, but I'm going to leave you with it. What you see, what you hear, because I think that this will seal the message in your heart. I'm just going to pray a prayer, and you're going to watch this, and then we'll be dismissed. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, I commit you to our Lord Jesus Christ. I deposit you into his charge. 
I entrust you to his protection and his care. I commend you to the word of God, the word of grace, the promises of favor. For the word of God is able to build you up. The word of God gives you your rightful inheritance and will cause you to stand strong, to be strengthened in your faith. For you are in blood covenant with almighty God and you carry within you the royal, supernatural Jesus seed remaining in you forever. Jesus is alive in us. I believe that what you're going to watch now will seal this message in your heart. And then afterward, we will be dismissed. Okay, Gab? Thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully you were truly blessed. You know, why don't you join us one day in person? Yes, please come join our family. We have uh, services on Sunday at 10 a.m. We have Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. And for you prayer warriors, we have Friday night prayer at 8 p.m. So please come join us. Hope to see you soon. Hey, check out our website and check out our list of all of the ministries that you may be able to get involved in. Please join us in person. Yes, our website is fgccpj.com. We look forward to seeing you. Please come. God bless.